do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Are bestsellers all they're hyped up to be? The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Hello and welcome to episode 44 of the Terrible Book Club. I am Chris and this is Paris. Hey. And this time we read Small Town Cop slash Big City Crime, A Man, His Dogs, and a Badge, written by Daryl Day and maybe ter Terry Brandom or two, maybe? Ba his last I don't know who actually wrote this book, Paris. <laughs> his, la his last name is uh, Bandomer, not Brandomer. Oh, I thought, but, it was, um... I thought it was, well, I'm already fucking up. Yeah, uh, so before we... <laughs> this book got me fucked up. Yeah, this, this book it, it is really unlike anything we've read so far. Um, A real gem, but let, let's, let's explain what we do here before we get started. Yeah, so uh, if this is your first time listening to The Terrible Book Club, welcome. Uh, just so you know, this is not really a regular book club. What we do here is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination thereof. So instead of reading books we think will be good, we choose things intentionally that we think will be horrible. Uh, so we're explicitly forcing ourselves to read books that we think we will not enjoy uh, and that we would never otherwise choose to pick up. So um, usually this experiment results in a hilariously disappointing read like today's choice. Um, although we have had, I think, I think one book, uh, did totally subvert our assumptions and it was actually good, but it's pretty rare. So, um, yeah, this time, as Chris mentioned, we read this book about a cop and his dogs. Um, All right, let me, I need to set the scene on, cause I'm very yeah. proud of myself actually. Cause you know, I spent a lot of time digging for some books for us to read a lot of the time. And uh, this one I feel like is a real, just mwah, like perfect example of the kind of books that I wanted to be finding when we started this podcast. Some like this diamond in the rough of the no enough something no one will ever have seen before. Everyone always, everyone, whenever we ask for recommendations, always go. People always go like, "Oh, Fifty Shades of Grey" or something like that. We, come on, man, no, we want to cover new, untrod ground. And I think I really found something here that is unique and special, um, in many ways. Yeah. In, so in, in many ways, the, basically, we found this because, uh, so for episode thirty-seven, we also read a dog cop book. But that was, uh, it was, episode 37 was like lawfully challenged Christian romance cop dogs. I don't know. It also had a super long title. I don't know what is up with cop dog <laughs> books and really fucking long titles, but I guess that's well, a thing. Well, over explaining things was a the theme in this book for <laughs> sure, that's too. True. <laughs> but um, so I had seen this random uh, post on Twitter, on the Terrible Book Club Twitter. Uh, well, it wasn't, somebody didn't post it to us, but I saw it in our feed. Uh, for that lawfully challenged book, and it looked really bad. It was, you know, like a self-published 90-page uh, Christian romance about a dog cop. So we read that for th episode 37, but while we were kind of looking into that, Chris found this book that we read for, for today's episode. You, you know how decided, I did it? What? Do you, do you remember? I, I typed dog cop into the Amazon book search. <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right, because I was like, hey, I found this really bad dog cop book, and you decided you were just going to, like, try to find it. I don't know why you, like, didn't yeah. wait for me to link you to it, and this is what you found instead. And we decided this was so crazy that even though technically it is, you know, uh, the same theme or topic that we did a few episodes ago, it was so vastly different and so weird that we would have to, we'd have to read it, so. Yeah, because this is not fiction. This is... A biography, perhaps an autobiography, because yeah. there's the authorship issue yeah. here that we should talk about right up front. Yeah. Uh, well, before before we get going, I just want to do some content warnings real quick. This one, this one's not very graphic, but <laughs> FYI, we do discuss uh, 
briefly and kind of in passing abuse death drugs murder sexual assault suicide violence and weapons like guns and knives um there's obviously like dogs and police i don't know if those things will set you off but um anyway that's that's done uh yeah, this, uh, th- so it says the book is by a man named Daryl Day. Uh-huh. However, the book is written uh, in first person and was clearly never edited by anyone. Oh, so, it was never edited no, by anyone. <laughs> no. No one so, took a second look at this. Um, And in the book, Terry Bandemer, the, you know, the main, it's not character, but the, the, the the protagonist uh, no the the i mean he's really the author it's his autobiography he talks about how he gave the um uh the the manuscript to daryl to publish so like daryl day is actually just a dude who took this other guy's shit and just put it on the internet for him i uh, so I, i think so yeah so really this is authored by terry bandemer who you know it's his autobiography but it says daryl day because Terry is not good with computers, and I think he just gave Daryl it to publish because Daryl is somebody who maybe lived in the same town as Terry, and... That's a shit deal because then Daryl's the one that gets paid for it, right? Does this guy just... Well, Terry does talk a lot about this book about how you should do things for the sake of doing them for good sometimes, so maybe he viewed this as some kind of charity upon the world to release Uh, his... So why don't we read the summary for everyone? Uh, yeah, let's let's do All right. that. So this is the summary for uh, Small Town Cop, Big City Crimes. If you are considering law enforcement as a career, you need to read this biography. If you are in law enforcement or were at one time, this is the book for you. Read about Terry's life in law enforcement to see what you will be facing should you choose this career. His stories will literally open your eyes to the reality <laughs> of being a peace officer. That This is the true story of a man that wore many hats. He was a son, a father, a husband, and good friend to many, but mostly, he was a law enforcement officer. He dedicated his life to serving and protecting people, some he did not even know. Terry Bandemer was top cop and received awards all the way from the police department to the sheriff's office and was given an American flag and an accommodation <laughs> straight from the White House. He was shot, stabbed, and looked death directly in the eye. A canine handler, he and his best friend Major, a black shepherd that rode shotgun as Terry's partner for over 10 years, tracked and apprehended criminals. Major, a highly decorated police dog, served without hesitation or concern for his own life next to Terry. He retired a top dog and best friend to Terry. He took a bite out of crime and enjoyed tracking the bad guys as he was born to do. He was a friend to all except the criminal. Follow Terry and his furry partner as they embark on some of the most fascinating adventures and law enforcement officer could ask for. Some would end in tragedy and haunt Terry's dreams even today. Some would bring peace and a sense of safety to everyone. Terry worked to protect. Uh, From murders to suicides and drug busts galore, Terry stood tall and faced his fears head on. Terry's stories will grab you and hold you as you read of his life as a peace (laughs) officer. He did it all for the safety of the people, and it was never about the awards or accommodations he received throughout his career. A day in Minnesota named for him and recognition for his services, (laughs) Terry remained himself. Quitting was never an option for him, and the counties he worked for were safer to be in because of Terry and Major. I'm a cop. I wear a badge. Book him, Dano. <laughs> so you know this Jesus is Christ. a digitally published book because you could not fit all that shit onto the back cover of a book. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's incredible. The summary is... It's an indication of what's to come. Uh, <laughs> that might have been. That might be the part that Daryl wrote. That might be like the only part. Yeah, and, I think the, like the uh, yeah. acknowledgement up front or something. Yeah, but that's the only part that Daryl wrote. No, you're you're right. I believe it is. Um, so our main characters here are, of course, Terry Bandemer and his dog Major. He actually has another. He has a few other dogs, but fuck all of them, I guess. Uh, I, I mean, don't know. There's one other dog that gets a good mention, but Major was like his first like canine dog, and they bonded together. So that's the one that's really special to him. But I mean, there's there's quite a bunch of faces that pop up in this book, yeah, uh, Paris, so, because so, uh, so. this is the first time we felt compelled to make an entire spreadsheet of which we had an argument about <laughs> which just... which like what people are, are spreadsheet worthy. Um. Yeah. So, uh, I started reading the book before Chris, and uh, I was maybe like twenty twenty percent into it, and I said. Chris, I'm tasking you with making a spreadsheet for this book. And he was, I think you thought I was joking, right? No, and, I didn't. Oh, okay. I took it completely seriously from the start. And I was like, no, I'm serious. Like, I'm seriously going to make a spreadsheet of all the names in this book because 
I can't keep track of or remember all of these fucking people that are mentioned. And Chris was like, oh, you know, how bad could it be? And then <laughs> there are there are about 200 individual people mentioned in okay, this book. Okay, well, Paris, can I say something that, like, so you've included people that weren't named. So, like, sometimes there would be, like, oh, this cashier in passing or something. No, or no, no. A mayor. I, I only added people who were titled or named. Okay. Um, so there's only like a handful. There's 213 on the spreadsheet. So these are these are humans yeah. and dogs. Yeah, even by with the way. my quibble, even with my quibbles about what belongs and what doesn't, it's still like 180 people that get it. Sometimes uh, they're only mentioned 200. like once ever, and like that's it. But <laughs> which we is felt why it, it's confusing. Yeah, because you have nothing to hang on to. Like you, you can't remember. <laughs> my, oh yeah. Okay. Well, can I tell you my biggest mystery in the whole book? <laughs> what? Who the fuck is Everett? He's mentioned as a Who? guardian angel. Okay, so early on, <laughs> when Terry is describing like family members that he has, he mentions an Uncle Artie that was killed by a drunk driver, and he he, he thinks that Uncle Artie looks over him from heaven because that's what his family told him. Yeah, and he says that he's uh, my guardian angels, like Uncle Artie and Everett. And uh, then Everett's never mentioned I, again. Dude, Who is it? Dude, this is how it, All right, this whole book is written in very, like, stream of consciousness, no editing. Uh, this man is in his 50s or 60s at this point. Um, and, and like Chris said, this is not fiction. I mean, we can't sit here and talk about the things that happen in the book as being ridiculous because it's... Uh, it's his life. It's his actual life. All of the I'm events sure in the book are true. I'm sure he embellished some things. Yeah, there are some things that I'm I question, but you know, um, I you know, if you Google Terry Bandemore, actually, if you Google Major, there is an article about Major the dog's retirement party. Yeah, um, I, by there... all accounts, Major was a good boy. Yeah, like, Major was, was the goodest of boys. Um, he was an amazing dog. It oh sounds yeah, like. yeah, he really was. I mean, it, and from what he said, it sounds like um. Uh, I mean, Major's brother, Baron, was, like, a canine dog, but he wasn't as good as Major or as decorated. But he had that bloodhound, uh, snoo snooper? No. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, let's refer to the spreadsheet. Yeah, it was yeah. Spooner, Paris. Spooner. It was Spooner. Um, yeah, so we had to make this spreadsheet because I we couldn't keep anybody straight. Um, and I jokingly was like, I bet there are, I bet there's, like, 75 people in this book. Nope, there's, like, 200 um, and, and I, only... I bet high at like 300 by the time I was halfway into the book. So it was somewhere in between. Yeah, the book is only 300 and something pages long. I mean, and that's on a Kindle. So, you know, it's not, it's I mean, not really that long. There's also the extra confusing factor of that some people have nicknames. Oh, and Jesus. And like some of them are referred to by nickname only. Some get a name and a nickname. Some people are just the name and you never get a nickname. I'm going to just... I'm just going to read, like, 30 of the names off. Okay, are you talking about <laughs> actual names or the nicknames? Um, I'll, It depends. Like, some we don't know the real name, but we know their nickname. Some we know both. Some we only know their real name. I'll just name. All right. First person mentioned in the book. God. He is also known <laughs> yes. as the Holy Father, the head of the you Trinity, know, the Lord, etc. Straight et up. Um, Got to tip off to the man upstairs before we get yeah, started. Uh, his, uh, so, Chris made these nice columns. One is real name. Column A is real name. Column B is a nickname. Column C is relationship to Terry. And column D is just notes. So we have God, uh, Holy Father, Head of the Trinity, the Lord, etc. Uh, relationship to Terry. First in Terry's life. So before Terry himself or his family, God comes first. Yep. Uh, God is also the reason that Terry is good at sports, he likes to mention. Um, yep. <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> um, Even though second, he mentions all the weightlifting and training he does, it's most it's, it's God's, God. really. Yeah, it's totally God. Um, uh, Daryl Day, the author. Also mentioned in the book. Um, yep. Uh, first wife. Never give it a name. Never ever <laughs> named. We don't know. He has two daughters. He had, they're named Ashley and Callie. Collie. Collie. Yeah. Th uh, those are his daughters that he they they divorced and he got some custody of them and he whines a whole lot about oh we lost this all this time together but you still had joint custody dude right no like, no so no, no they didn't have joint custody his wife oh. took the kids away and he only got to see them like once in a while and that begs the question like. Why didn't you get custody, Terry? What'd you fucking do? And the whole time he avoids getting into the reason that they got divorced, doesn't even name the first wife, and it's it's just weird. Um, we got Terry Terry Bandemer, whose nickname is Bando. We got Elton Brand Bandemer, whose nickname is Mink. And then yep. uh, 
Terry's mom, Lorraine, her nickname is Quest. Yeah, Quest. <laughs> what? Q U A S T. And his dad, oh, Elton's oh, Quest Bandimer. Yeah, and his nick and his dad's nickname is Mink. Like, I don't understand where these nicknames came from. Uh, How about go. there's this whole list of like nicknames oh, that were Jesus. never given a first name? He just like spills out let me read oh you yeah read a couple more of the, of the no you read a couple more of these other characters and i want to read the string of nicknames that are never revealed as real people oh we got we got parker aunt dallas barry tim joe kevin brian uh dan <laughs> there's so Dick, many joe how many Sharon, joes are there in this a book, bull though? named a black angus bull named billy yeah, uh, all right. Miss Parks, Aunt Betty, Uncle Eli, Grandpa Edwin, Grandpa Mary, Aunt Melva, Grandpa Bandimer, Grandma Bandimer, Uncle Marv, Aunt Verona, Uncle Wally, <laughs> Uncle Hubert, Aunt Christine, Uncle Walter, Cousin Gary, Uncle Artie, <laughs> Everett, Potter, Scotty, Jeff, Everett. Randy, Gary, Joe, Bill. And and by the way, that's a different hear, Joe. Yeah, I was going to say, if you hear the same name multiple times, it's not a mistake. It's two distinct Joes or Jims or Jeffs or whatever. There's like five Joes and like also six people were drafted to the Minnesota Twins. Like, yeah, I, I, it's like four people that are mentioned as being drafted into the Minnesota Twins because Terry liked to play baseball a lot. And I guess a bunch of his teammates were on the Twins or some yeah. somehow, but uh, he didn't make it. Yeah. So, you know, you get a book that's about 300 pages and you have 200 people to worry about. I mean, you're getting a new character every couple, every page and a half. Like it's... <laughs> Just... I mean, a lot of them are, like, because he'll describe, like, crime scenes or, like, investigations that he did. So they appear for, like, the duration of the couple of pages that that investigation is laid out for. But still, there's, like, a bunch of them. And when it's not written, because none of this, this book isn't written in chronological order. He jumps between time periods at will. It Like, one character, Kirch, he moves from, like, his, an investigator to a chief deputy to a sheriff and back again <laughs> so I, to a point where I have no idea what time frame I'm in. This is like Slaughterhouse Five, yeah. but instead of like World War One, it's fucking dog cop. Yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> let's let's read some nicknames that appear in this book. So after Quest, some people will show up with nicknames, and a lot of these sound a little. Oh well, as Terry puts it, oh, oh, it sounds mean, but we're really not trying to be mean. It's just the way we were. There's a lot of that kind of apologetics yeah, for there's a lot of like giving oh, people the, shitty the nicknames. good old days and everyone now is too politically correct and you know a lot of a lot of that all right so here's some nicknames that appear in this book for you uh like we said uh bando mink quest <laughs> kb kev tubby pinhead porky potter putter <laughs> legs pin legs that says leps leps i'm sorry leps <laughs> and pin legs heifer brownie bj Bottles, Snow Cone, Wheaties, <laughs> Tack, Cheese, Spike, Skippy, Wix, Artie, Gunther, DJ, Crash, Little Pisser, Booger, Augie, Shimo, Fuzzy, KJ, Dumber, Billy the, Billy the, the Bull, Bull, Spot, uh... Moose, RW, Wild Bill, Dispatcher D, Iceman, <laughs> Simply George... <laughs> The Fury, Big Dad, Jaws, JB, Sly Shide, Whitey, Tuffy, Mage, Kent, Herbeck, Herbie, Fritz, question mark, Nipper, Triple O, Chief Tim, and then there's 70 more after that. <laughs> yeah, that was like not even a, a lot of them. Uh, yeah, so reading this book is really disorienting because like like Chris was saying, there's there's no like temporal space. You don't know what's gonna happen, where you're gonna end up. Like, I mean, I and one second he's working in Rizzo County, then he's a Lake of the Woods guy who's like a nature reserve cop or something. Yep. Then he's running his canine stuff with Major and like a bunch of his buddies in Minneapolis. Yeah, it's really bizarre. Like he'll suddenly change topics and time period in the middle of a paragraph without any warning and then all of a sudden you're like wait what the fuck is he oh no and there are also numerous spelling errors uh syntax problems it's just i mean i think i'm just gonna randomly select one See, of I the think many. the back end of this podcast is just going to be us reading all the quotes and notes that we did because you kind of can't appreciate this book like in a chronological order because okay, I'll lay it out for you right here. All right. Terry Bandemer has a lot of friends and family that were very important to him. He really wants you to let you know how they affected his life. Um, he was a canine cop and he was a cop for like a couple other areas. One time he, he worked like 
this lake county that was very like outside so he was on a boat a lot next time he helped in some homicide cases he took down a lot of drug busts with major major did a lot of competitions he had a bunch of dogs and then he retired that's the chronological order of the story with a bunch of like investigative cases in between and i think at this point we just have to move much like terry does from topic to topic at will at at random so Uh, fucking buckle up everyone Uh, all right so if you've ever watched law and order svu um i'm sure you're familiar with ice t's character on the show uh a lot of this book comes off like like if if there was an episode of SVU where Ice T had been hit over the head and had like amnesia <laughs> and you only saw the world through his eyes in like five minute intervals at random periods of time. Uh, yeah. That's kind of what this is like. Uh, yeah. I'll just <laughs> I'm just going to read some random selections. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> A peek into the the mind of Terry Bandler. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to choose some random spots in the book. All right, so this one, uh, this is when he's at the beginning talking about his family. My mother always made sure that we were well fed and that sometimes could be a job all in itself. We all liked to eat, even if it appeared that we did not. We were a bit on the small side when we were younger, but as we grew in age, we also grew in size. In the words of my aunt Dallas, <laughs> she yelled aloud at us, eat, get big. That is exactly what we did. Um, Eat has like seven exclamation yeah, points yeah, after it. Yeah, has like five. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, so apparently this they had this aunt that was just screaming at them to eat at all times. Get time. big. Uh, and then my mother influenced my life in deeper ways than she may even know. I guess what she didn't know before, she will know as she reads my story. She taught me the importance of being kind to people, to help them when they needed help, to stay out of trouble, and oh yes, she taught me to always make sure my zipper was up. That one I think was so I didn't become embarrassed. She touched my growing years in ways that I still use today. <laughs> what does that last sentence mean? I don't know. Um, uh, um, I'm I'm just gonna like I'm just yeah, gonna keep going, keep going, keep and, going, and stop when I get to a highlight. Um, my favorite thing, like I don't know if you can find one of these quotes, is that Terry overexplains a lot of things, almost like. I mean, you can tell he's oh, a cop oh, by the, the way thinking? this was written. The thinking but, stuff? Yeah, yeah, like that one, we should get to that. But like, you can tell that he was a <laughs> cop by the way this was written. Because it's kind of written like a police report. Because it's like, and then we laughed. And then the laughing was good. And then and, I left yep. and the and scene. Then and then yeah, it... we both laughed together. And there's, qu- by the way, all the dialogue, it definitely didn't fucking happen. All the criminals, every time a criminal is caught, they do one of two things. If it was a case that Major was on, it will the criminal will say, do not let that dog eat me that or bite me, please. Oh, me. my God. I, I, I will be eaten up by that dog if you do. I will turn myself in. I've realized how awful I'd, I that I have been. Or if the, if Major wasn't involved in the apprehension, the criminal will just go, well, you caught me, Terry. I can't believe you did such a good job. I guess I'm going to jail now, and I have learned my lesson. That is every fucking criminal, except, like, three yeah, of them. Yeah, it's very weird. Oh, here, I got a good one. Um, my mind went to places that perhaps other people's minds did not go. I took in what people told me and absorbed it like a sponge. Once inside my head, I ponder the words or ideas and came to my own conclusion. Yeah, no one else does that, yeah, Terry. He thinks no that one's the, ever come, the, the, held a thought <laughs> idea in their head and thought about it. Yeah. Um, Holy just, shit, dude. I, I mean, let me read some of my favorites here, too, because... Please um, do. Uh, hold on. Let me find one here. I mean, and we're also going to get to the parts where he kind... I think he admits to police brutality a couple of times and also to abusing his younger brother. Uh, but he just glosses over it like hee hee ha ha like he doesn't even notice that he's Th- that's just what you do crimes. oh my my dad taught me to be tough by when he handed out a punishment we knew what was coming to us because that's what you ha- that's how punishment has to be in Terry's world uh yeah I'm actually while you're looking I'm gonna read this passage about how he abused his younger brother so a few yeah. pages before he talks about how his older brother had uh had like a, you know like beat him up and he was like oh you know in this politically correct world that might not sound good but it made me tough and then you know a chapter later he said I feel bad for taking advantage of Tubby and yes I did just that I made him play catch and fast pitch and one on one football when I got my PR24 which is a nightstick of sorts I even practiced up for Tubby with that I think he even took some bites from Major a few times <laughs> so in one sentence he admits that he as a kid as a teenager beat his younger younger brother with a fucking nightstick, and then as an adult, let his police dog bite his younger brother. 
Yeah, that's super messed up to do. And you, like, the fact keeps... that he just glazes over that yep. and also just generally kind of being rough with criminals. Yeah, uh, definitely admits to giving a criminal a rough ride, which is where you put someone in the, in, um, like a, um, uh, a, you know, police wagon and then you intentionally, like, stop short, hit potholes and, like, try to injure them. And, like, you don't, you know, you don't properly secure them. So they're, like, flying around the back of the wagon, basically. Um, yeah, well, here's another passage about Terry on how to learn from your mistakes, which you think he would learn from some of these incidents, but. I made those things a lesson. I kept the things I had or had not done stored in my head. The next time I was faced with the same or a similar situation, I pulled out the memories and made certain I did not make the same mistake again. Thanks for the tip, cop. Yeah, he, <laughs> like... uh, he also reminds us at one point that uh, helmets are a type of hat <laughs> and like other weird things. Oh, the, that... way, the way it's phrased is like, I wore many hats, some of them helmets or something Yeah, like some, that. sometimes called helmets. And we're like, uh, all right. Uh, speaking of weird phrasing, at one point he says, in my time of sports, when he's talking about his <laughs> yeah. time playing baseball, uh, which is yep. not a Led Zeppelin album I've heard of, but it sounds like one. Uh, also, he talks about being, so he talks about going to a technical college to become a police officer and like how it was really hard it's just a community college with a two-year law enforcement program I, I don't know it seems yeah it's a tech school with a law enforcement program um and he talks about how the dean at the time uh tried to ban sports and their their coach was like without sports the only thing this school is gonna put out whips like i don't yeah. know uh that was he like quits over it doesn't he doesn't that coach like quit <laughs> yeah, over he, it he walks out because without sports <laughs> there's no reason for us to have any education if there's no sports involved. Nope. Uh, I don't know. He talks about some near-death experiences he has. This man, I don't know if it's just a product of being in Minnesota, but he's had, I think he describes three different run-ins with bulls. Yeah, uh, at least two. At least two. And there's one where he gets attacked as a kid with one of his friends and gets... That's Billy the Bull that was B mentioned yeah, Billy, before. Yeah, Billy the, the Black Angus Bull. Um... And then there are two other incidents, one when he was older where he was, like, helping someone else corral an angry bull. And then there's a third time, too, which he talks about maybe in passing, but, I don't know, a lot of bull are there just a lot of bulls in Minnesota? I, I cattle know. country over there or something. Uh, yeah, there's just, uh, I mean, most of my notes in this book are dot, 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 what? Because I yeah. just can't understand what he's trying to say. Because, like I said, there's no editing in this. There was no editing at all. Um, I, I, you know, I really think that what Terry should have done, he should have written this out, handed it to an editor, and had someone heavily edit it. Um, and you would then, think that's what Daryl was supposed to do. Well, Daryl didn't fucking do anything. I mean, he if, didn't do shit. If if he did. I would be very surprised because this does not read as though it was edited. Um, uh, yeah, Terry. Terry's life is, I don't know, it's also interesting because Terry's like, oh, you know, he acknowledges that he had a good life, but I think he doesn't really understand how good of a life he had. For example. Really? Explain. Um, so Terry, you know, had, you know, a full family growing up, had a house. Uh, had grandparents, mom and dad, had brothers, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, seemed to have a pretty good time in school. Uh, didn't even have to apply to college before he was done with high school. He finished high school, applied to technical college, and got in. Like, not very stressful, you know. He had um, an in-between. Didn't he have a gap year or something? Yeah, he... I think worked a little bit for maybe six months or eight months or something. That's where um, all that bull stuff happened, he probably. He got married while he was... It, maybe when he was 18 or 19 or something. Very young. Um, definitely very young. You know, and then, you know, does cop school for two years, gets out. He sent out five whole applications and got his first police job with those first five applications he sent out. And then he was just a, poli a police officer for his whole life and then was able to retire at 50. Yeah, cops retire early, dude. And I was like... Wow, I don't think this dude really gets like how blessed of a fucking life he had. I thought I saw him thanking a lot of people and saying like, "Oh, it's because of you that I had a good life." Though I don't yeah, see I, where you got the ungratitude. No, thing. no, no. It's I'm and I'm I'm not saying that he's not grateful. I'm saying that I don't think he thinks about the 
like socioeconomic reasons as to why his life was so good and that it wasn't just about like hard work and other people being kind to him oh yeah definitely That's oh what I'm saying. for sure like he okay, totally has blinders on when it comes to anything you know he's the kind of cop who's like oh the criminals have way more rights than we do and oh wow drug dealers sure are bad huh mcgruff the crime he dog lo- like he yeah, loved it's... finding weed people it seems like he got a lot of coke dealers and meth people too but like the weed he was especially proud of of seizing <laughs> Yeah, Major, one of the reasons Major was such a good police dog, as Terry describes, is because he tracked down, like, a million dollars worth of drugs over the course of his dog career. Uh, and also possibly was addicted to coke because he sniffed coke <laughs> one time. Yep. And then f- forever after that, he was really good at finding coke. That's what Terry says, so all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, Major Major, the police dog, you know, a life not without struggle. He also, <laughs> he also, you know, fought the white, the white man, the white snowman. <laughs> yeah. um, just, just imagine that dog just like, you guys got some coke. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I just need... I, come on, Terry. I can smell oh. the heaven. Why do you keep taking it away after I find it, Terry? Yeah, please. Yeah, it, Terry. Um, yeah, there, there's another. So Terry puts this dog on a pedestal. But at the same time, you start to wonder a little bit about how good he really was to the dog. Because, one, there was that time the dog did coke and then was, like, maybe addicted to coke forever. Um, oh, he felt bad about then, that, though. He felt super bad about yeah, that. He then, didn't want that to happen. Hey, you know what he doesn't feel bad about? You know what he talks about all the time? Uh, all the time. Giving the dog beer. Just always oh, yeah. give... Oh, b- b- Major could <laughs> give drink him a cold with the one. best of them. Give him a cold <laughs> yeah. one. And I was just like... This is, you know, and it wasn't like a one-time mentioned joke. Like, no, they literally no. gave the dog no. beer. Yeah. And um, they, gave, they gave him like a steak dinner and a beer all the time as yeah. they, like, he's one of the boys. Yeah. And then there was a, there was another passage where he talks about how like when he and Major were out on a call or investigating, he would talk shit to Major like he was a human companion and be like, oh, yeah, I like, can't come even on, find man, that she... guy. You fuck the like, oh. <laughs> Who talks Jesus shit Christ. about pets? Like, what the fuck? I mean, he's more than a pet. Let's be real. He's, he's a, a he's law enforcement officer partner. officer of the dog law. He, look, I Major was a real dog. He seemed like he was a good boy. I will not have any bad words said about Major. No, no, no. This, Major's this, this. cool. I didn't. I didn't have any problems with Major. I and felt let's be bad. Real, like, we're, we're talking about some, a real guy right now, and it seems like he was decent at his job, and he was a boon to his community. It sounds like overall. Oh, the dog, absolutely. Um, I would say Terry a little uh, bit too. Uh, mostly fine, probably. Uh, I mean, the way that he talks about. His career, it really makes me wonder. Um, I mean, uh, everything always goes Terry's way, and the criminal always realizes, like I said, like, oh, wow, you have caught me, Officer Brandemer. I guess that I have seen the error of my ways, except for, like, three guys, like, Sly Shide and Triple O, I think, are, I mean, like, still... remember when he cuffed a suspect in front of his body, and then the person ran away, and he was like, oh... Yeah, oh. That... That was one of oh, his that, oopses, Chris. Oh, yeah. He, he won't say a mistake. He said, I made an oops. That was one of my oopses. Uh, yep. And uh, my other one of my other favorite lines, uh, I, I want to find it so I can get the, the uh, perfect delivery here. A lot of my cases in homicide ended in suicide. And I was like, well, it sounds <laughs> like, like you're doing a real bad job then. Like, I don't, I don't know, friend. Referring that to the wrong department, it seems like. Yeah, it's yeah. He says. How do we still uh, talk? Uh, like, are we still on Quoteville, or should we talk uh, about some of the cases that are described? No, here? I, I have a, I have another quote. Uh, okay. Each oops taught me, and I absorbed <laughs> the learning, so I didn't repeat the same actions ever again. There's yep. one time where he describes the cold and rain and bitter cold outside. Uh, cold and rain, bitter was... cold rain. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that. Uh, there's a, there's a time at the earlier in the book where uh, there's like a car accident that he responds to and uh, there's a woman trapped inside of a car and for some reason he thinks it's a great idea to crawl into the car wreck with her. I, I it's don't... so that he can lift like he was it was so he can like lift something up off of her while he was in there or something. Uh, yeah, it was also like the first car accident he responded to. I think. Yeah, I don't know. Um. Another good quote I like, uh, which is indicative of the over <laughs> the cop style writing almost. He's talking about when he was applying to get the job at the sheriff's department. And uh. he says, the sheriff's department was very aware of me and I was extremely aware of them. 
So I just had this idea of like the two, like him walking by the sheriff's department, just like looking at it shiftily, and like someone like cracking the door in the sheriff's department, peeking outside, and seeing him, and yeah. shutting the door. Oh wait, wait, wait! No, I got a, I got another good paragraph. I've got another, uh, another good paragraph. Okay, <laughs> let's just trade let's, quotes. Yeah. The two new investigators for the county had their first homicide. I was able to see how they worked the case right up to the interviews and court proceedings. One of the investigators caught my attention, and I focused on his actions. I learned how to question a suspect and when to be silent and allow the suspect to talk. Inspector Kirsch was top of line, and I had the greatest respect for him. He impressed the hell out of me, and I knew this man would teach me many things along the way. From the first day on, I honed my skills by his teachings and a few others that showed me success and good training. It made me effective and skilled when chasing, tracking, and apprehending a suspect. The only deal breaker would come as soon as the suspect said those magic words, I want a lawyer. Oh, how those words would come back to haunt me in one of my biggest cases years later. <laughs> oh, yeah. I bet. How dare so a suspect have rights and exercise them? Yeah. Oh, oh how, how those words would come back to haunt him. Uh... Um, at one point, uh, he's describing um, a funeral procession <laughs> happening. And he doesn't say he he doesn't say what you expect him to say. He's talking about a hearse driving off, and he says, "And the funeral home drove away." <laughs> that made both the whole of us fucking thing just up and left. It's a mobile funeral home, right? Yeah, it's you know? really it's a, it's like a food truck but full of dead people. He's, oh, jeez, that's it's a hell of a food <laughs> truck. That's like a <laughs> Mrs. Lovett's meat pies food truck. Um, oh, like another great line. Uh. It's about a suspect who killed someone that was trying to take his own life. Uh, he shot her in the head at close range while she was still in bed. She was bleeding a lot, and he wanted the blood to stop oozing from the gunshot wound. He thought that if he kept shooting her, the bleeding would stop. His actions only increased the bleeding, and he needed it to <laughs> I don't think... Is that really what you're thinking? Did you get that in the confession room, Terry? I, yeah, or do you, like, is that what you think he thought? Um, There's just... There's so many uh problems in this book where... Uh, he has uh, misspellings because he's using like homophones or or ne- or like near homophones. So throughout the entire book, whenever he wants to say commendation, he says accommodation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and things like uh, pedal to the metal, he'll write M E D A L, like pedal yep. to the metal, like a like a metal you win instead of M E T A L. All kinds of stuff like that. I mean. Uh, wor- uh, whole words missing from sentences. Uh, weird punctuation. Uh, oh, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. I just I saw another one of those quotes, but uh, th- I don't know. It's oh How yeah. How about some of his like very poor similes and metaphors? Oh, like um... the entire sky above the lake and the boat looked like a dark room. <laughs> that- wow! <laughs> That's great. Um, my favorite is how throughout the whole book, every time he talks about a case with a death in it, he says that the, the, oh, whenever yeah. he thinks about the people involved in the case, they wake him from a deep sleep and they, they keep him up at night and they haunt him. Like every case haunts him. This dude is every constantly ca- yeah. haunted. Like he can't go anywhere without ghosts. There's like at least 30 cases in this book that haunt him specifically. So I'm wondering if he has like a rotating month schedule. Like, oh, okay. Well, I had the one about the murder-suicide couple last night. So that means tonight I'm going to have the one about the the dude in the dress that shot me twice. Um, and that means after the next week is going to be all of the other uh, killing sprees. <laughs> yep. The next and then one is going to be the time I got all, stabbed. All the, all the dead kids. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here, yeah. Some things still sneak into my dreams at night and wake me. That scene is still one of those I cannot seem to wash out of my memory banks. Um, <laughs> He's and, got and a other... real tough schedule. He's got every night. It's just something that happened to him. Yeah. Um. There There are other thi- other uh, th- uh, like cases or incidents he mentions that make me think that Maybe he wasn't a great cop. There was a uh, when he was um like a sheriff or warden for this lakes district. Um a, lo- a lot of his job involved uh like water rescues and like checking up on people who were fishing or boating because, you know, accidents could happen. And uh <laughs> he talks about this one time that he found uh, a lady out in the water. I was patrolling the shoreline when she flagged me down. She had no clue as to how to steer the boat. She waited until I reached her, slowly going around in a circle. I got alongside of her enough to reach out and shut the motor down. I wondered how she would react now that the boat was, the boat was still. I was more than just a little impressed. She told me exactly what had happened and asked if I would help her get to shore. I hooked up to her boat and towed it to shore. 
uh, sorry, I missed the para for that. The context is that uh, her husband was bent over the motor dead from an apparent heart attack, and she didn't know how to get the boat down. back to shore. Um, she couldn't get out of a turn. Yeah. So while while we were waiting while we waiting on shore for the coroner, she talked to me a little about what had happened. She was terribly saddened by the loss, but had a good attitude. She said that they were together and they were doing something they both loved when he died. She said that was exactly the way both her and her husband wanted to go. I asked her if she would be all right, and she nodded a yes. She told me she would have her cry after her husband was taken care of. She thanked me for helping her and turned to the coroner who had arrived. The way that she handled the situation made things so much better. I rarely had a death that the spouse wasn't screaming and panicking, making everything more intense. I really was thankful for this lady's attitude. And, like, my note is, obviously, she fucking killed this dude. (laughs) And you're just like, oh, wow, what a calm, collected lady. Come on, man, she put too many, like, uh, blood thinner medication in his drink or something. Come on. (laughs) Seriously. Yeah, it's like a couple times I was like, I don't think you really And that's like, yeah, that's like his lake cop excursion. By the way, later in the book, during a different time period after his lake cop adventures, he's, like, going through some marsh or swamp or something. And he says, it was a first to find just how deep water can be. And your note was, weren't you a fucking lake cop, <laughs> yeah is... yeah like i it's just so many things in this book make no it like i said it's very he'll contradict himself oh, a sentence later yeah all the time it's it's really bad uh one of his, oh man here's another paragraph trying to paint you a bit of a canvas painting here you had a sight <laughs> that made me cringe in pain and laugh so hard at the same time the bull's sack was stretched tight as major held on tight he went from dragging yep. his paws to try and slow this beast to swinging high in the air behind this beast major bit of bull's balls yep. <laughs> yeah maybe that was the third bull attack that i you... <laughs> think it was yeah yeah, I mean, I'm just scrolling through here fucking reading quotes because it's... how. Yeah, here's another one that confused us. Brad was apparently feeling his oats that day. What? What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. What is feeling... What Are you feeling your oats today, Paris? I guess I guess it's like feeling himself, you know? That's the thing the kids is say, it? right? But why, I, why I is his oats? Minnesota, oats. I don't fucking know. Like... <laughs> Uh, and then he has this weird, like, dog eugenics passage, which really made me annoyed. Um, as he's talking about buying Major. So, the funny thing about Major the dog is that there was not even a canine unit uh, at the police station or sheriff's office or wherever where Terry worked. He just decided he was going to go out and buy a purebred German Shepherd and then show up to work with it and be like, Oh, uh, I have a dog. Like, we have a can canine it, can be a unit, cop dog? Right? And his, his like, I don't, I don't know, the head of, I don't know if it was the sheriff or, I, I don't his know. His chief. His, his chief, chief. The chief or sheriff or whatever was like, well, if you raise enough money, I'll let you have a canine program. So they had, like, fucking bake sales to have a canine program. And, uh, but while he's talking about uh, the dog, and he was, like, looking for a breeder and stuff and talking about, oh, the difference between males and females. And the males work much better for the work we needed them to do. Uh, females were har- as hardworking as any male would be, but the difference was that females bonded tighter because they have that built-in mother instinct to protect. They want to stay right at your side to make sure that you are safe. That is most certainly a fantastic instinct of what makes a mother a mother, no matter what the species. It is simply not something that works as well in the canine program. Except, every time he talks about Major, he talks about how he always wanted to protect Terry and his family, and how, yep. like, he is so protective and so bonded to Terry and his family. And so, it, it like you were saying, he contradicts himself a lot. Um, Another there, choice quote for Hugh here is when he's talking about a drug bust, and he describes having seized regular drugs as well as coke. Yeah, what are regular what's drugs? A, <laughs> what's a regular drug? Ugh. If coke isn't included in that, like, is regular is that weed or is it like prescription I, stuff? Fucking, I don't know. Um, is, is it like oh, kind of he, a bunch of valiums? Oh, um, some of my other favorite quotes from this book are all the very obvious statements. Uh, it was a great experience for me, and I was in a continuous forward motion while we were training. <laughs> Yeah. Great, good. I'm glad How you didn't about, slip back here, your time. Terry. Yeah, here's another one. Uh, the feelings that overwhelmed me flowed out of my eyes. <laughs> Really trying to be poetic does, there and falling flat. I'm does, sorry. Does but... he know uh, Dean Jean-Pierre? Yeah. Did yeah. he it's, co-author it's, woman worship? It, it sounds like whenever he talks about being in love, it's very woman worshipy. Yeah. So maybe they would. They need to hook up and like co-write dog <laughs> worship. I don't know. Dog worship, yes. 
Your fur so soft. Uh, Your woof so deep. <laughs> oh, nothing like that <laughs> microwave dog food can. <laughs> <laughs> Over candlelight. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's also just some weird situations. <laughs> oh, like hold on. <laughs> I am glad I did not shoot him because he would have missed out on a great life. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good. Uh, one of the weird scenarios that, y- you know, if you're just reading quickly, you might not think it's weird. But if you stop and think about it, you're like, oh, that's fucking weird. Maybe it's just because um, I actually had a, a German Shepherd that was like a purebred and like from a fancy breeder and stuff. Not not for any reason. I don't know. My mom was a, a dog breeder and like really into dogs. So I have way too much dog knowledge. Um, and... We went through training with my dog. I mean, of course, she wasn't a police dog, but um, I've you know I've seen German Shepherds go through like intense dog training and stuff, and a lot of the dogs that the breeder uh, we bought from did become police dogs. And so anyway, they're talking about Major going to dog cop school, basically, and they're talking about trying to make sure he was aggressive because they didn't think he was going to be aggressive enough. And so their solution was to have one of the trainers get behind a tree and dress oh, yeah. up like an elf and start hissing. He had, a, he had like a red hat or like a bal- balaclava yeah, on a or red something. red hat, a huge red stocking hat and <laughs> hiss. So he got behind a tree. It was like, <sighs> well, he had a red hat on. So, and then the major and, wanted and, to kill him. And I was like, yeah, major, major does not like any fucking elves. Get the fuck <laughs> out of my forest. The fuck out of here, elves. Yeah, that was really strange. Uh, I, I didn't really know how to explain that. Uh, you know, we've been, like, talking for 40 minutes, and we've been kind of shitting all over stuff. I want to, like, take a, just a quick second to say here that, like, it, I don't know if this book is worth, like, having been written or whatever, but Terry does seem to have some redeeming qualities in that he wants to just really do good and protect people that are innocent as much as he can. He has empathy for people, <laughs> he and he, he understands that people need counseling after traumatic events, which is surprising coming from someone that like talks about oh you got to be tough you got to be tough as hell all the time that's true that's true i did well but again he doesn't he only has empathy for people kind of in his field of vision like i said he has blinders on when it comes to socioeconomic and racial divides and like um kind of the deeper reasoning why Oh, for, um, sure. for why crime happens in america right like he doesn't really get any of that uh, but in his narrow field of view, certainly. Um, but he he has this very um, kind of like buddy cop show from the 50s view of the world. Uh, and I guess that's not surprising because that's what he grew up watching. Um, and being. And being, right. Um, it, you know, and, and sentences like this kind of demonstrate his sort of like very simple view about the world. I have over 30 trophies we received from the dog competitions, and they all sit in my attic collecting dust. Some of the trophies are huge, and I like that. <laughs> and he's just like, <laughs> wow. Okay. You know, like he, I, yeah, I mean, this is like a book about a very average guy's life uh, as a canine officer. I mean, is that so bad? Does it, does every book have to be about, especially biographies, have to be about someone that did, like, massive things? He seems like he lived of a, a, a simple life, or is living a simple life, that didn't get too in the way of hurting other people. He probably helped more than he hurt. Well, well, sure. Like, I, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I, I think that it really should have gone to an editor, and it oh. really should have been totally yes. rewritten, basically. Like, they could have just taken the content... And rewritten it into like a, you know, uh, an exciting detective biography or something. Um, but you know, you also have to keep in mind that uh, this might be an autobiography. But is Terry a reliable narrator? You know, we don't really know. Um, I don't think so. Let me see if I can find some dialogue here to to read from because if you hear one line of dialogue, you've pretty much heard all of the line of dialogue. Yeah, I mean, and, and sure, he paints himself in a pretty good light, but again, we never know why he went through that divorce. We never know why he didn't have custody of his kids. We never find out about... I mean, he mentions a couple of mistakes he made, but like, we never really hear anything 
truly terrible that he recognizes it terrible. You know, like he admits to police brutality and for abusing his brother, but he doesn't think those things are bad, you know? Yeah, no, he probably just sees them as like, well, that's what criminals deserve and you got to grow up tough. Exactly. That is exactly what he feels. Um, Here's an example of some dialogue, by the way. Wow. I will never, ever doubt Major again. He is definitely better than I am at finding drugs. Thank you for your help, Terry. That's apparently that's, what a, a suspect said, right? Or another, no, no that, another that's, cop. That's, that's another a, cop. Yeah, it's another cop that was like, I don't know if this major will be able to find things. Yeah, and there's like a weird passage where he's talking about how they were having an issue in court because the court was like, oh, the d- the defense argued that a dog could not speak and only acted on its handler's say. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that the justice system understands how police dogs work. Like, I don't think yeah. that's a, that's a thing that's like contested. That, that's <laughs> yeah. Weird. I'm sure that they've figured it out by now. That's a kind of a weak throw by whoever that defense lawyer was, to be honest with you. Here's a fun line again. Well, I'm just pulling more shit out of the hat here. <laughs> evil begets evil. And somehow the aura that is put out by such evil is smelled and followed. A girl filled with evil sniffed and the two men became entwined in her own scheme. The <sighs> This was about some lady named Jules that hired two men to rob her grandma and kill her so she could collect the life insurance. Even though earlier in that section, Terry was like, oh, wow, she was hiring men to rob her grandma for a couple hundred bucks. The value of a human life is so low to these scum. But then he says, oh, she wanted to kill her for the life insurance. So clearly it wasn't like that low if she was trying to also get the life insurance. Yeah, that's By the way, these two men then just go off and break into a bunch of people's homes and rape and murder them and steal their shit completely unrelated to the grandma because they like went to the wrong side of town so they were like let's just start up with this rape and murder thing anyway (laughs) yeah that was a weird story uh i i have two other choices so back to the dog eugenics um He starts talking about how white shepherds are, like, inherently different from black shepherds, from, you know, classically, you know, black and brown German shepherds. He says, I had been told once that white shepherds had an inferior complex. I I think he's trying to say an inferiority (laughs) complex, but a dog can't have a fucking inferiority complex. Uh, He goes on to say, they were known to have some serious genetic flaws. A movie was made in the 80s about a white shepherd that was trained to attack only black people. The show starred Christy McNichol, and she tried to tame the shepherd, but it never happened. The movie gave the white shepherd a bad name for a long time. Somewhere along the line, someone forgot that the dog did what he did because he was trained to do it. In fact, the white shepherd has a docile personality in comparison to the black shepherd, but still, there are flaws in the white shepherd for certain. So, yeah, he has this, like, weird racist opinion about dogs? Like, I, uh, like it's, why it's do you need to mention... Some dogs apparently supposedly only bark at black people. It's like a thing. But no, that, I mean, it's not a real thing in life. That's not Yeah, true. some dogs, there's definitely some racist dogs out there. I, I, no, Chris. What you I've have... known a racist dog. Okay, what you have to understand is that dogs learn from their human handlers, so yeah, no. It's not but, the dog that's racist. The dog is picking up on its owner's racism, most likely. Sure, but then it is acting in a racist way. So therefore, it is a racist dog. Oh my god! But anyway, he's like trying to say <laughs> that white shepherds have Philosophical an inferiority racist complex, dog and he's talking about he randomly mentions this movie about a white shepherd that only attacks black people. Which, like, you don't need to say like it's, it, uh, you don't need. To you talk just about mention that. the movie in passing. And, oh like, god, yeah. It's weird. Um, He's talking about how shitty the white shepherd was named Snowball. And how he was such a bad police dog because he wasn't a black shepherd. I just, I. Well, it seems like Terry, honestly, like while we're on the subject of dogs, Terry does seem knowledgeable about dog training. And he definitely, he apparently started a dog law enforcement training business after, I don't know when, if it was like after he retired or something, but he did it for like, it was like seven (laughs) years with a friend of his or something. And he cranked out a whole lot of trained dogs. So I'm assuming he's. (laughs) knowledgeable in that especially if he trained major sure so. but trying to say that black and white shepherds are uh so different that only one type is suited for police work is just not the case and also trying to say that one type of shepherd has an inferiority complex is not a thing uh i don't, I don't know he i'm sure he knows about d- police dog training but in terms of knowing anything about dog breeds and temperament i don't think he really knows anything yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, th- I mean, 
<clears throat> again, it goes back to how reliable of a narrator you think Terry is. And you could kind of pick up on some things. Uh, there's definitely some embellishments that happen in the book that I don't completely like all the criminals just saying out loud, like, oh, wow. I've been caught by Terry and Major. I will just turn myself in. You, you guys sure did a good job. Yeah, you oh, are the scariest cop and dog I have ever encountered. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and there's also one part I forgot to mention. I, someone at some point goes up to another person and rips their pants in half. And it's a funny story that Terry recounts. <laughs> And I really don't believe that someone just ran out. Like, it was, like, supposed to be, like, a violent pantsing or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. I, so I was just drinking a sip of water. I almost died. <laughs> um, yeah. He, like, while he was still in uh, community college for being a police officer, he witnessed a cop rip someone's pants in half and, like, rip them off. Yeah, just the <laughs> sheer yeah, fucking. Like, I don't think that happened. That's some shit quality denim, my friend. <laughs> yeah, unless unless you're wearing yeah some pants that were already falling apart. I don't think that that happened. Um, <laughs> oh, so another another wonderful quote I just found: dealing with someone high on meth is like struggling with a freight engine. And I was just like, I don't know, is it? Is it Terry? Maybe, Have you ever struggled a with bit. a freight engine? I don't know. Um. He also makes this claim that at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, so at the, you know, the temperature of freezing on the Fahrenheit oh, scale, yeah, this thing. there is no scent. But oh, I thought at first he was talking about, like, under freezing there was no scent. But no, it is only directly at 32 degrees Fahrenheit yeah, I, where apparently smell doesn't exist. Yeah, smell disappears. He says there's no real explanation for this anomaly. <laughs> it was simply a fact. I don't, I don't think that's think how that's science works. No, I, I don't mean, think that's how science works. No, it's not. I mean, smells obviously intensify in heat and humidity and are far less noticeable in the cold. Uh, I'm not but, uh, a chemist or a biologist, even if this is, so I can't even if this explain is why. True, even if this is true, there's a reason. There's an explanation yeah. for it. It's not just a fact is what I want to say. But, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, he... Uh, that's not true. I mean, I'm definitely like Chris. I mean, you have to just think to yourself, like, have I smelled something when it was below freezing? Yes, I have smelled things. When well, it was no, below he says specifically only at 32 degrees. And which that is everything. Uh, does. No. Oh, one of his other brilliantly poetic phrases. Um, he's talking about the moon. Uh, and he says that God's giant flashlight was working well that night. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Always got to give it one to the big man upstairs. <laughs> Yep. All right. Here's a here's a rant about uh, not a rant, but like a paragraph about a certain criminal uh, named Leroy that was just basically another tough guy, sort of a thief slash drug dealer. All right. When we got to the jail, Leroy decided to turn on the asshole in him again. He was ranting and raving about how we were all assholes and about Major. He was cursing me and threatening about what he would do when he got out of jail. I will take care of that fucking dog, too. I will kill the dog that bit me. You watch and see. I didn't understand how he could still not be in pain, but he wasn't. Until he calmed down, there would be no booking. I didn't care if he sat in the cell forever. I could wait it out until whatever he had been on when we caught him wore off. I knew that there would be no doubt as to when that was. Major had left his mark on Leroy, and it was going to hurt something terrible when he came down from the clouds. And that, that basically goes into the situation where uh, Leroy had his leg mangled up pretty good by Major, and uh, basically Terry and his cop friends try to prevent him from getting painkillers at the hospital. Yeah, uh, it's another instance of police brutality that he meant he admits to. Where they refuse to get this man medical treatment uh, because they just want to be dicks to him. Uh, yeah, because he, he was an asshole criminal, so he deserved it. <clears throat> um, can I talk about the criminal that was apparently a serial thief and hoarder? Oh. Do you remember that guy? <laughs> oh, that's a great one. That was actually this really one, This funny. one really stood out for me because apparently, like, I, I, I believe this is true. There was, a, there was a, a rash of, like... Heavy farm equipment thefts and, like, a bunch of other kind of valuable stuff that was, like, Terry describes as, like, oh, this is really hard stuff to move and lift. It can't be just anyone until he eventually tracks it down to this guy who has a bunch of shit in his, like, a bunch of the stolen shit in his front yard and in his house. And he goes up to the wife and he's, like, oh, can I take, uh, what's your husband doing? Does he, what does he do with all this stuff? And she's, like, oh, he just buys and sells this stuff to make money. But apparently he never sold any of the stuff. And come to the point when Terry rounds up all the stuff, there's apparently 1,952 stolen items on the property. Yeah, and and he's like, oh, the wife definitely didn't know anything about what was going on. And I was like, Terry, why did you think about that for like a hot second? 
<laughs> I don't think she was like, oh, look at all, look at these thousands of stolen things. Like, where she did that never happen? questioned that. Like, he never sold them. Or, yeah, like, I, yeah, it, that was really good. Uh, yeah, another instance of when you're like, Terry, I don't, I don't know that. I, I don't think you got that one right, bud. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I found a really good sentence. Supposedly, though. Uh, he spends a lot of the book going on and on about how Major is really awesome and how he loved Major. Poor Spooner. Spooner doesn't get nearly as much airtime. Baron even less so. Uh, yeah. Then Spooner there's a, a blood Harley. Hound. Hurley. Oh, Harley. Yeah. Um. So he's talking about how when Major retired, um, Major the dog had a retirement party. Like I said, you can find the news article about it. It's real. You can also find pictures of Terry Bandemer. I even found a photo of his house, which was kind of weird. His retirement home in Florida. Weird. Um, so at Major's retirement party, uh, Terry's friend Jaws read a little thank you to Major and he put it in the book. And my favorite sentence is this one. Thank you, Major, for running into the woods after a man with a gun so that we did not have to do it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much gave away the game right there. Like, Even though he talks about a whole lot about other people being cowardly all the time, it's like, how dare you be cowardly? But like, you're the one sending the dog out, dude. Come on. Uh, oh, this is uh, this is another example of how he over explains things. As you go through life, you learn to watch for landmarks. They are visuals that remind you of a path you have taken before. This helps in the return to or from a destination you have perhaps <laughs> never been, or at the very least, traveled only now and then. Hansel and Gretel use them in their story, <laughs> although it wasn't really all that great for them. The pioneers used them to trace oh, the way the back pioneers and forth. Rode these babies for miles. The open prairie, a building or a sign or a stand of trees, all work well to remind us of where we have been or where we are going to. Thanks for explaining how landmarks work. <laughs> yeah, it's like that happens so many times. I uh... oh, can I read another <laughs> quote from a criminal slash Terry because this is apparently the only one liner. And I, I don't believe that he actually said this on the scene, but I bet he came up with this later and felt cool about it. Yeah, sure. And it is pretty cool, to be honest with you. <laughs> Get your damn dog off me before he eats me. I laughed at those words and was my usual smart ass self. Don't worry about that happening, bad luck Stan. Major doesn't eat junk food. Ooh, I mean, that is an iced tea ass line. <laughs> yeah, if, there, if there has <laughs> ever been an iced tea ass line in this book, that is it. That's um, definitely it. <laughs> so. Um, he was describing, uh, I, uh, oh, right. There was, okay. So for some reason in this book, he talks about two, um, attempted suicides where people were like sleeping in preparation for their own suicide. They were like and he, yeah, sleeping he, he foiled with their both gun. by sneaking up on s sleeping people <laughs> snuggling up with their gun. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're having, like, a major depressive episode, you're sleeping a lot, but, like... The, okay. He, he, <laughs> when I was in a position to see clearly inside of the house, I saw the suspect sitting by a table, and he had his head down and a shotgun lying by his side. The fact that he was sleeping was a good thing. The past had taught me that someone sleeping gave me a little bit of an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Oh, my God. Oh Jesus! Oh, this book is just. Can a I talk about the, the basically? There's only one time where Terry like really turns mean on purpose, and that's when he talks about the seven dwarves, the types of cops he hates. Oh, Essentially, yeah. it's just him listing off like if you know the names of the seven dwarves: uh, Grumpy, Happy, Sleepy, Dopey, Doc, Bashful, um, Sneezy is another one. Yeah. So you know, just take those out for you extrapolate them to the types of cops he hates. He hates people that sleep on the job. He hates people that call in sick all the, all the time. He doesn't like people that uh, are, you know, grumpy at the job because the why the fuck would you take the job? And he especially doesn't like bashful people. He fucking hates the bashful. Let me tell you, he keeps saying bashful a bunch of times in every sentence when he's talking about bashful people. Bashful, bashful, you don't best not be a bashful motherfucker in front of Terry. <laughs> Terry's gonna fucking backhand you with his gun. Um he will bash you full... <laughs> Uh, um. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I kind of hate the same sorts of coworkers that Terry hates. So I get it. You know, somebody that calls out all the time, uh, somebody who's lazy. Like, yeah, sure, all those people suck. But again, we're only getting his perspective. So, like, who the fuck knows? Um, oh, yeah. So I want to talk about homicides and suicides. 
Uh, his chapter, it's weird. He has them, he has this book broken up into chapters, but like they don't really mean anything because he talks about everything at every point. So, he tries to divide them up into like, oh, this was my Lake County gig it, time. It this was my though. homicide. But work. no, he goes off topic all the fucking time. Um, this is entitled Homicides and Suicides, A Tough Road to Hoe. Uh, which <laughs> is just good really comical for something that's so serious. Um, I mentioned this line before, but he opens the chapter with a lot of my cases in homicide ended in suicide. Uh, I think that there is an added sadness with suicide because there is no quote unquote next step. There is no way to fix what is done forever. And my note is like, oh, sick. So you're like a necromancer and you can reverse <laughs> murders, but not suicide? Yeah, homicides. Like, yeah, this come, you can come back from those. Yeah. I, I think I, the idea is that there's not a criminal to catch to I, like yeah. get revenge on. I think that's what he means. I, I think so too. But again, he does a really shitty job explaining it. Um, I don't know. And he makes this, he tries to take like a dig at, uh, doctors and psychiatrists saying that they they label and put suicide in a bottle. Um, I mean, I guess sure, a lot of things Is he can be about, suicide. Like, psychiatric medication. Yes. Yeah. Uh, All right. He's talking, but he also later he values therapy. He, well, you can value therapy, but not draw, not psychiatric. Drugs, I guess. Right? Yeah, yeah. I guess that. So yeah. that that's where he stands on that issue. Um, I don't know. He. He does a couple of times, like, he talks about how people praised him for going above and beyond, but it really just sounded like he was just doing a cop. You know, like, you're just doing yeah, your like... job. Like, I don't I don't feel like, like, he talks about how, oh, I, I walked the crime scene and secured the area to make sure it wasn't touched by outsiders. I really went above and beyond, and I was like, nah, that's just what <laughs> that's... cops do. Like, I don't, I don't get it. Didn't you learn that the first course at Alex Tech or whatever? Sorry, what? Didn't shouldn't you have learned that like one on one course yeah. at Alex Tech or whatever? Yeah, um, it's another example of weird dialogue. Uh, he's talking about how he he uh, found this couple and there was a murder suicide and he found a note that they left. Um, I read the letter to Whitey over the phone. He said, quite as a matter of fact, there we have solved the case and now it is given to the coroner. He canceled the <laughs> lab and I sent the bodies to the coroner. Like. You canceled the lab? And also, I don't think finding a suicide note in a murder-suicide means that the case is just solved and over. Like, you would still investigate to make sure someone didn't stage it. Like, I, yeah, I guess not in Minnesota. Yeah, like, really quick to just wrap the whole thing up. Yeah, hey, you know what? Go commit crimes in Minnesota. They don't fucking look, look <laughs> at, like, they don't look too far beyond the Give obvious. Give your husband a couple of, like, blood thinner medications in his drink and just let him keel over on the boat on the river and oh, just tell good. the cop, nice cop, they're like, oh, I'll just deal with this later. Just be a nice person when you show, when the cop shows yep, up or you and they can, won't suspect you. You can uh, shoot a couple and just leave a fake suicide note and pff, done wrapped up good good to go how about here's some high, here's how you solve cases actually here's a quote that tells you how, how the cops handle it in minnesota jim was one of those bad boys that my old partner toby would tell me to just kick them in the nuts and be done with it he said that sometimes that was the only way that some criminals would learn i think he may have been right <laughs> that's some cartman ass like thought process for how to deal with criminals man um i would like to talk about i would like to read through uh, part of my favorite case in okay. the whole book. Which which one's that? <laughs> the family live next to a single retired gentleman. Their oh. last name matters very little, and omitting it protects loved ones. There were three children in the family, aged 10, 12, and 17. The suspect we will call William, and there was no love lost between the family and William. The children disliked him as much as he did not like them. William would call us, saying that the children had thrown rocks at his boat. He was always extremely irritated at the children and had tolerated their games for far too long, as far as he was concerned. They would walk across his yard and stomp his grass. He said they were always loud and obnoxious. This was a recipe for trouble waiting to be mixed. The day of the call, Deputy Chuck had already been to the house once. William told the deputy that the kids were causing trouble again, and he had just about had enough. The deputy spoke with all that were involved and thought he had taken care of it all. He was sadly mistaken in this thought. Nothing had been resolved and the trouble was about to happen. It was not going to be a quiet incident, but more likened to a volcano erupting, a lava flow being spewed out like spitting something hot out of your mouth. Not even an hour had passed since the deputy had spoken to them. The call came in from another county saying that they had received a 911 call from a 10-year-old boy. 
All right. So based on what I've read so far, you would think like this is going to be like a like a silly haha. Oh well, the neighbors work it out and get along. No, that fucking old man killed that whole family and himself All of them. because the kids were throwing rocks at his boat and were stomping on his grass. Killed the whole fucking family, like killed them all execution style, and then shot himself Jesus in the shed. Christ! <laughs> yeah, like whoa! I, I there's mean, so many just like shotgun murders in yeah. this whole book, dude. Minnesota, dangerous place. I mean, you're getting the view from a cop that sees yeah, it. They, they were like over the years and shit too, but like. I just was you know, like, I was, it that way. I was reading this and I was like, I don't know if I believe that this happened because this sounds totally fucking crazy. Like, I, I don't know. I believe it happened. Yeah. I mean, I, I think so because it, do, it doesn't seem like. Old men just get so mad about tiny shit. I just see so many angry old men angry about little tiny shit. Yeah. Now I'm so terrified of the elderly. Like, I'm petrified. I'm petrified of old white men specifically. Yeah. Those are the worst in general. All right, I don't know how much more I could talk about with this book, honestly, because we've given you the the idea here. Just jumping between random thoughts and ideas, a bunch of different cases, some choice quotes. Um, do you have anything else to mention here? <laughs> I have one last thing to, talk, to, to mention. But... Oh, sorry. Uh, mostly, I don't, I don't know. Um, it was confusing. It was tough to get through. There's a lot of stuff we glossed over and didn't get to or something. Maybe in like some kind of filler episode we can bring – mention those back up again. But maybe read the book on your own if you really want to dig that don't, deep. No, this... Chris, don't <laughs> fucking tell anyone to read this. What's wrong with you? I'm sorry. I just hurt all the time and I want someone else to feel it too. Uh, yeah, well, they can listen hurt to this people, Hurt people, hurt people, Paris. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I know. <laughs> there, was, there was a criminal who – I don't know, for some reason, couldn't afford a mask or didn't have one. And so his solution was to just cover his face while he drove through town with his hand. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Good good job. Uh, at one other pre- police brutality moment, uh, this isn't the one thing I wanted to mention, but <laughs> apparently they give a criminal a, a banana as a snack. And as a joke, the one cop sprays it with pepper spray beforehand. And the criminal keeps eating it and, like, getting burns in his mouth. And he keeps saying hot nana over and over, yeah. but keeps eating it. I mean, so the guy definitely had some mental health issues. And the cops just, like, fucked with him and didn't help him and just treated him like shit. Yeah, like, giving him... A banana covered in mace? Like... He was like a nuisance that, like, called 911 all the time. Yeah, and you know what Terry fucking did? He went to his house, ripped his phone off the wall, and handed it to the guy, apparently. And that man's name was Jim Cool. (laughs) K-O-O-L. To be fair, this is a man that set his own couch on fire to call 911 (laughs) because 911 said, don't call me unless something's on fire again, Jim. So, mm, I mean, that's definitely not worth macing a banana and giving it to that dude. No, I I think the guy just had mental health issues. I can understand ripping the phone out of the wall or something. All right, but... Uh, uh, would you like to know the final mystery for me in this book, Paris? The, yeah. the one thing that, aside from Everett, the unmentioned Everett, this one, this one was a deeper mystery for me <laughs> okay. that is going to haunt me at night. <laughs> okay. One time, Terry's making a traffic stop for this guy. He's gonna, he's he's going to write him a ticket. It's like one of his you know tickets. <laughs> yep. And he he missed this guy. He starts he start asking him what's your name. He says, "Oh, I'm George," and that's what Terry leaves on. He oh, he was simply George. <laughs> And apparently this is the only man to avoid a ticket from Terry successfully because they just had a connection. <laughs> That's the reason Terry gives. He's like, Didn't we had he a tell conversation. Did he looked good in his, in his uniform? Yeah, he, he told Terry he looked good in his uniform. Terry says they had a lot of shared interest and that they had a connection. So he tore up the paper and George drove away. And as far as I know, they never saw each other again. But Terry had like this feeling of connection to him. <laughs> What the fuck? Like, did he have like some kind of weird, like, gay for only oh, this man? Yeah, moment? yeah. I mean, they definitely had, you know, a passionate day and night together. <laughs> and then, you know, he tore up the ticket as a, you know, as a symbol that they could <laughs> never speak of this or see each other again. And then simply George drove off <laughs> into the distance. And that was it. And, you know, Terry, Terry was a changed man, but. <laughs> I mean, he's a, he's a... I mean, you do you, Terry, but that's just such a... It's just a weird yeah, moment was, in the book where he's like, really and weird. this man just drove off into the sunset and never <laughs> yeah. did touch my life again. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, there are a lot of things like that where you're just like, the fuck, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, I have a few I have a few other, like, random things. Um, yeah, he's talking wrap about, it up for uh, us. He's talking about, like, a... a um, a drunk driving incident and they talk he talks about how they charged the passengers as well 
And I was yep. like, why would you charge the passengers? They weren't, they literally were not driving while intoxicated. So you can't, I, I don't know. Um, another really weird, uh, oh, we, t- we forgot about the other instance of weird racism in this book. Oh, the, the dispatcher lady? Good old dispatcher Patty. Um, <laughs> so they have this dispatcher who is new, I guess, and she heard a phrase used on the radio when they when the cops were talking about uh, Native American suspects they were pursuing. And then she, or she, she repeated, or she had heard them use the phrase before, and then she repeated it over the police radio because she thought it was code. She didn't <laughs> it's understand. definitely code. She didn't understand that it was, like, an incredibly horrible thing to say. Uh, and Terry's like, oh, haha, we had such a good laugh. We told her, like, she just couldn't say it on the radio. And I was like... It's definitely police code, because uh, guess what a lot of police tend to be sometimes? Fucking racist. Oh, another thing. While we're on the co- concept of Native American criminals, can we talk about my favorite Native American criminal duo in the book? <laughs> yeah, that's who I was about to talk about. Yeah, okay, that's... you do it then. You do it then. Uh, so they... There were these two young Native Americans, you know, not young uh, First Nations men. They tried to steal a vehicle from a farmer at gunpoint, apparently, and I don't remember why, but that, like, didn't work out, so now they were just running away through the woods. And then when they caught them, uh, I think Major had actually grabbed, like, uh, the sleeve of one of the guys, and they're like, what's going on? Like, and as they're apprehending him, like, as they're, like, running up on the suspect, because Major had, like, cornered them or whatever... They're like, what is all this, like, white stuff coming out of this guy? <laughs> and it was apparently one of the young Native men uh, stuffed his shirt with paper towels so that it <laughs> yep. looked like he had muscles. It's because it impresses the ladies? <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I've... Okay, I, so you know how in, like, TV shows and movies and stuff they show... There, there's often these scenes of, like... Uh, smaller breasted women stuffing their bras with like paper towels. I've literally never seen that done in real life. And this is another one of those things where I'm like, I don't I've never even heard of a man. I don't think this is a real thing. Yeah, I like, think this is an embellishment, man, I, because like Yeah, I think so too. The, the ruse would be up very quickly if you brought someone back to your apartment or something, right? If you're actually going to, like, score based off of it. Right? Like, what, are you going to, like, run to the bathroom and take your jacket off and suddenly be much skinnier? <laughs> yeah, well, like, no, no, no. You keep the jacket on, you see. You're oh, like, okay. baby, I, I only do it with my jacket on. That's Why are like, you very, like, mushy over here? <laughs> Will you take your jacket off, please? No. Just leave the lights off. <laughs> no, it gets, like increasingly uh, more complicated with his padding choices. He's like, oh yeah, the paper towel is too soft. I gotta come up with something that really feels like muscle. And it's like... <laughs> because he sweat into the one time and they all got really damp. <laughs> Melted. <laughs> yeah, it, ugh, it's so strange. Um, all right. Anything else? Uh, I'm trying to see if there... <laughs> just, just a couple other sentences where I was like, what? Uh, I had been involved with the victim and the man behind the crimes committed. This was another case that the punishment did not fit the crime. The things that happened to the victim were not a time happening. What? what? <laughs> um, we're not oh a time god. happening. Oh my god, Chris. We forgot about fucking Connie Nelson Sharp. Oh, god, yeah. Right. That's like the whole other fucking... All right. Dude. So really quick. Oh, this is, this honestly, is... this is another case where... Um, a lady had an abusive husband. She tried to divorce him. She had to run away, but he kidnapped her and tried to. He took her to Mexico for fourteen days while Terry tracked her down. Uh, yeah, but except don't we find out that Terry doesn't like Terry is credited her. Uh, uh, sorry, excuse me. Terry is credited as being her savior, and apparently she's like, "Oh my god, if it wasn't for Terry, like I'd be dead." Blah blah. But don't we discover that in fact the only reason that Connie is found is because her abductor tried to take her back across the border from Mexico to the U S and their passport was like expired or something. So like really Terry didn't do fucking shit, but took, you know, credit for this. He went down there to pick her up from like the, the the border crossing, I guess, so that he could separate her from her husband. I guess that's what she means. Yep. Um, the day after Tuffy had said to me, I got a call. It had been 15 days since her abduction, and we knew no more than we did the day she had been taken. The call was from the Mexico slash United States Border Patrol. They informed me that they were holding Jim and Connie in their jail. Jim had tried to cross back into the U.S. to get parts for his Jeep. He had apparently done this several times without being stopped. 
When asked for ID because of the way that Connie was holding her arm, uh, she had broken her arm, Connie told them she had no ID. She was too afraid that the language barrier would leave her words misinterpreted to speak up. The Border Patrol thought she might be concealing a weapon. Sadly, she had her arm inside her coat because the stroke on the landing had left her partially paralyzed. They then, oh, sorry, I guess, I guess she was paralyzed, not broke her arm, sorry. They then asked Jim for his ID and ran a check. They found the warrant issued for his arrest and bingo, they had him. So, yeah, like, I mean, I guess, clearly... I, I'm assuming that they would have released Connie and her husband or put them together for a while. So he was there to separate them. I no, I mean, they had a warrant for his arrest and they knew why. So, like, I don't know. Oh, all right. I, anyway, anyway, um, the other weird layer to this whole Connie story, because he talks about it a couple of times. Then he does like a longer breakdown towards the end of the book is that Daryl Day, the guy who's credited as the author for this book, Small Town, Big Small town, cop, big city crimes, a man, his dogs, and a badge is also the- <laughs> Were you about to say small town, big cops? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, is all- Daryl Day also wrote, apparently, Connie's autobiography. Yep. And I took a look at that, and uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of similar to this. It's, it's not hmm. good. It's real bad. Well, I- yeah, I, I mean, I wonder what the deal is here, because yeah. that will be the final mystery surrounding this book, because I still don't know what Daryl actually did. Yeah, it's like, I don't know if he just recorded them, like, interviewed them, and then just typed it all up, or if they wrote it and then gave it to him, and then he rewrote it in the first person, or, like, just published it without editing it. I, I don't really know. Uh, very weird. Um, oh, yes, that book is called Stolen Years, A True Story of Domestic Violence and Survival uh, by Daryl Day. Uh, don't I don't recommend reading that one either. Don't nope. fucking read any of his books. He has a bunch of like witch books and some other stuff uh, that we also considered, but we decided this one since you know this one's this too is unique. One, this is one. Cr- cr- this was close to Chris's heart because this was yeah. the one he found. I'm sorry I put us through this Paris, but we made it. Yeah, it was. We're done. This uh, episode is pretty much over at this point. Uh, yeah, I mean, like like I said, it's it's hard to really talk about this book in a coherent way because it is written so incoherently um d- don't fuck don't read this book don't read this book it, yeah no very terrible uh, book if this you're, is definitely a terrible book i don't know i guess i don't really have any recommendations for like if you are interested in um you know uh canine officer's life and work or like if you're curious i i really don't know what to tell you but it's no, not yeah, this book it's not our, it's not our forte sorry so. Uh, yeah, but at least you know, don't read this one, and don't read, um, the book that we did for episode 37, Lawfully Challenged. Both of these books, not a good source. Nope. Not a good source. Don't do it. All don't right, it. well, we made it. We survived. Uh, we don't know, I don't know what we're doing for our next book, uh, so that's a surprise. Um, yep. I'm gonna, so before, before we go, <laughs> before we go right to the closing, um, I would just like to do a little bit more reading of names for everyone. Okay, yeah, let's um, go down just, the spreadsheet. Just a little bit, just a little <laughs> just bit. So. The, cat, the credits are rolling. <laughs> so, God and First Wife and Daryl Date, Bendo and Mink and Quast and Parker, <laughs> on Dallas and Barry and Tim and Joe, Kevin and Brian and Pinhead, <laughs> <laughs> Porky Potter, Potter and Left, Pin Legs Up for Brownie BJ. Oh, I can't, I can't do this forever. Uh, Fuddle, Snow Cone, Wheaties, Tag, Cheese, Spike, Skippy, Wicks, Artie, Gunther, DJ, Crash, Little Pisser, Boogie, Augie, Shimo, <laughs> Fuzzy, KJ, Dumber, Dick, Dumber, Dory, Dumber, Sharon, Dumber, Black, <laughs> Angus, Bull, Miss Parks, Ani, Betty, Uncle, Elton, Grandma, Edwin, Grandma, Mary, Melva, Grandpa, Brandomer, Grandma, Bandomer. All right. Yeah, it's fucking ridiculous. Uh, I'll read some at the end. Oh, yeah. This dude's wife's name is Tuffy. It's probably her nickname. No idea what her real name is. Uh, Catelyn, Doug, Mick, Cujo, Brad, Suzette, (laughs) Gretchen, Gerald, Ron, Roy, Sergeant, Denny, Andy, Cody, Beulah, Spooner, Tim Jones, Laser, Baron, Deputy, Ock, Triple O, Chief Tim, Jody, Joe, Frank, Harley, Deputy, Don, Deputy, Charlie, uh, Johnny, Be Good, Jason, Be Good, Dick, Sherry, William, Julie, Anne, Milo, Teddy, Mrs. Teddy, uh, Little Two Fingers, One-Legged Larry, Trooper Springs, Jane, Queen, Connie, Nelson, Sarf. Jim Sarf, Dan Alquist, David John, Jules, Leroy, Ben, Sally, Trevor, Officer Barney, Corey, Rich, <laughs> Red, Gaylord. Oh, Gaylord the Attorney. Oh, I love Gaylord. Uh, I mean, that's not even, I'm not going to read all, but that, yeah, it's it just goes on like this. A, a sampling of some characters. 
Uh, and now to Why read... don't we read our own list of names? I was going to say, yeah, our... now to read our list of names that actually matter. Uh, so <laughs> before we end the show, let's thank our patrons who make these terrible books possible. Uh, thank you to Dari, Greg, Veronica, Will, D, and our newest supporter, Jared. Thank you very much. Um, all of these wonderful people make this show possible. Uh, they help us support hosting and books. So uh, thanks so much for joining us on this terrible, thank you. terrible we'll adventure. you. We'll come up with nicknames for you, too, maybe. Oh, no, I wouldn't. Who wants to be a little pisser? No, 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 (laughs) no one wants to be that. Um, And if you, too, listener, would like to become a patron, you can head over to patreon.com slash join slash terrible book club to check out our extra content and rewards. Uh, We also love when people say hi and interact with us on social media. So please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, We also have a Goodreads profile, which I always forget to mention. Um, And if you so desire, you can send emails to us at terriblebookclub at gmail.com. Uh, and lastly, if you enjoyed the show, uh, which I hope you did, if you've gotten this far, please do us a favor by sharing the show on social media or writing an iTunes review um, or just telling your friends about it. A uh, special shout out to Will this time because he's like a sharing monster. He's always sharing our episode posts. What up, uh, Will? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the shares. Thanks a lot, dude. Uh, yeah, I think, that, I think that's all I've gotten. All I've gotten. All I've got. See, this book broke me. Yeah. Like, I'm, yep. I'm saying things incorrectly now because this fuck... God damn it, Chris! The next book, can, can well, the next book be yeah, like the well next written? book when a time happen will be <laughs> no accommodated no for you. Oh, uh, fuck! <laughs> All right, Paris. See you later. Bye. Bye.